Uh, well, no, there was there was a big boom of erotica around Fifty Shades, so I think I think that is legit comparison. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't really know what the current trend is. Thinking about it, um, no, I don't. I'm hoping we're just coming out of that trend. Thing. Yeah, because I feel like that that was a trend in itself to have a solid kind of marker of a book say yes yeah. it's about vampires yes it's about porn or sex or whatever or mm -hmm. yes it's about angels I, I feel like maybe people have cottoned on writers have cottoned on that yeah. this is a bad idea <laughs> maybe yeah. you should just kind of be more disparate I think it's a fatigue thing as well like for it with dy dystopia was another very obvious one there was this raft of dystopian fiction and you could see it in, in fact how stuff like how the film adaptations were performing so the first Divergent film obviously did very well but by the time the last one wasn't doing very well at all to the point where they're not even going to make the last film I don't think so you could actually see the interest in dystopia waning and I think that happened with The Hunger Games as well again very popular first film figures have fallen quite a lot by the time of Mockingjay and I think that people just get fatigued by it you know they're like oh god not another girl going up against the government oh it's just I, I do think that people just get tired of it and they feel like they're being marketed to by that point so yeah and also it's like it's a, it's a really big challenge to write in something different in that same narrow sort of mm. genre as, as already out there anyway. It's like, you know, choose your own stories. Well, I think one of the worst things that a writer can possibly do is say, yes, I shall write in this particular genre, mm. and then go, yes, I'm going to stick to this genre. I write in this genre, that is my identity. I don't know anyone who does that. The people who I know who write, write stories, and then later on, someone says, do you suppose it's this drama? And they go, eh. Yeah. And it's just, I don't know anyone who would go, yeah, do you know what? This is, this is important to me. Each novel will have particular classifying elements. So, so almost everything that I write has fantasy in it. But I'm not going to go out and study the conventions of fantasy as a genre and then say, ah, oh, I shall self-consciously subvert all of these interesting conventions. That's list, not yeah. a really, that's, that would be such an academic way to write. And that's not, I think, what most people do. I think most people will feel their way through it and go, this feels boring. Why is it boring? Oh, because it's done, been done a hundred thousand times before. Mm -hmm. What do I want to happen? What is interesting and fresh? Then you write that. And it's, it's much more of a tactile process than a oh yes, I'm going to be genre bending and genre smashing. It's, genre is, I think, a lot of the time something that is considered after you've actually got a story. Oh yeah, definitely. Having said that, I, there is an impression in publishing that authors need to have a brand. Um, and so, for example, my, my brand is kind of weird fantasy, I guess. Um, and I, I think, feel like I'm in there with you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Slightly weird fantasy. Um, so even though my book, The Priory of the Orange Tree, vastly different from The Bone Season, it does still fall within the weird fantasy kind of label. Um, and I think it would be quite weird for my publisher if I were to drop on their desk tomorrow a romantic comedy about teenagers in a high school, because it's yeah. not me that's not a Samantha Shannon book um, and I think that would be quite puzzling and actually I may have to end up writing it under a pseudonym I don't work in publishing so I might be wrong about that but from speaking to other authors who have tried to do that there is a kind of a sense that you need a brand and that readers need to sort of associate your name with some kind of they need to know at least vaguely what they're getting when they have a book by you so to some extent if you if you want to be extremely experimental and write tons of stuff that is like vastly disparate from each other then you might need to consider using a pseudonym but often that pseudonym can be really close oh, so, yeah. so i think ian banks is a really good example mm -hmm. so as ian banks writing kind of brilliant high literary stuff as Ian M. Banks writing yeah. quite gritty sci-fi. Yeah, no, I've seen that. Like, um, Joanne yeah. Harris is the yeah. same. Um, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. It's, she uses her middle initial. So, yeah, it's fine. Um, but just something to consider, I guess. Like, even, even if you want to be, you want to try tons and tons of different things, there is a certain culture in publishing, which I'm sure is, has a lot of marketing support behind it, which is that you need your brand. I can completely understand why, though. Oh, yeah, no, same, Because if, yes. if Cadbury's came up one day and said, we've made a motorbike, you'd be like, what? <laughs> no, exactly, yeah, you do out need... Out Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Like, out of chocolate, no, out of machine. <laughs> yeah, everyone would be like, what, Cadbury? Um, yeah, so, no, I, I understand the reasoning behind it. But, um, yeah, definitely, I can imagine it would be troublesome for some writers who want to write extremely different things and really experiment and do it all under the same name. Um, I, I can imagine that will be difficult yeah yeah <laughs> um 
So story comes first, essentially. Yeah. Uh, do, do you think there's too much of a hang-up over, over genre? Especially yes. with fantasy, yeah. you know, there are so <laughs> many different sub-genres of fantasy. And I quite often get people you know, having one new discussion and say, you know what, write your story. It's and so then let's look at it or let your publisher or your agent decide exactly. That's what I did. Yeah, yeah I, I literally, actually, when I emailed my agent with the bonuses, I was like, hello, um, I don't know what this is. Um, <laughs> this is... I don't know what genre it is. I don't know who it's aimed at. Um, you decide. Cause it was, and also, the main character is a really weird age. She's 19, which is just out of the YA comfort zone, but it's also not really in the adult Jane adult Jane comfort zone. Jane, Jane, Jane Eyre, but that's Jane Eyre, not really. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's like, it wasn't, it was kind of out of both zones. I just so think Warden's pretty Rochester y. Well, no, he is Rochester. There we go. Well, yeah, you can tell that I have a Rochester thing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, that was kind of weird. And I basically, so, and also, I get questioned all the time on like, for, so I'm published by Bloomsbury as adult, and they pretty much just put me in like fiction or fantasy as a general category but I have quite a significant YA audience so I get I get people who are like but why are you an adult it doesn't make any sense then I have people who are like why does anyone categorize you as YA it's so clearly not YA and like no one knows what it is um, but I consider that a positive thing I mean, I just, you know divergent voice don't try to define me <laughs> Do you think there's a bit too much of a hang up on the reader demographic age range? What's YA? What's yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, it's, I can understand why because yeah. like booksellers obviously need some way to categorise it. Yeah, so, they need to know. Like, so when you're, have you been a bookseller? No, I haven't. What, okay, so I was a bookseller I've just seen for five minutes. Oh cool. yeah, guest books. Right, it was really cool. I was a bookseller for a really brief amount of time. I was a yeah. Christmas bookseller at Waterstones over the exact period where you're made to wear the embarrassing red reindeer shirt oh and the really? antlers rather than the dignified black shirt that they normally have. <laughs> well, uh, exactly, <laughs> and it was just there were so many elf jokes. It was really irritating. Oh, no. But the books arrive in these big blue totes, and they're completely mixed up. It will just be kind of by publisher because that's mm. who they ship in from or by supplier it's not by genre and the job of the bookseller partly is to just put these on the shelf so if you see a book that really looks like crime but is in fact romance nine tenths the chance it's going to go on the crime shelf rather than romance they're not reading blurbs they don't have time you have to look at it go what genre is it put it on that shelf I thought Fifty Shades was crime when I saw it yeah it, it really imagine does imagine my quite. shock and it's imagine got <laughs> on the front <laughs> they don't have time the time <laughs> I was, I was like, oh, it's sort of a business crime novel. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, nope. oh, those beads are going in the wrong place. Yeah, I was like, oh, oh, oh handcuffs. Sorry, someone's being arrested. <laughs> but I think the other thing about genre as well, the, the bad thing about it is it can put people off reading. So often you'll get someone who says, oh, I'd love to read your book, but I don't read fantasy. Or, I get so much of that. Or occasionally I've heard people say, I'd love to read your book. Not to me, I should add, but to other people who have reported this. I'd love to read your book, but I don't read books by you know, women. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's like, it's like, I see, so you don't read books by half the population. Why is that? With it? You know, it's sort of women's fiction, isn't it? <laughs> like, and, and of course there is an entire genre called women's fiction, which is puzzling, because what is women's fiction? Oh, whoever fiction? came up with that needs to be shot. <laughs> yeah, it's a chiclet. Yeah, and, well that's the thing, and you, you get books that get boxed like this and you get the, and it's it's really unfortunate because some people obviously decide that they only read sci-fi and then if you try to present them with say your book which has an element of kind of science fantasy to it but they'll be like oh no sorry it's historical yeah I don't read books in the Victorian era that's not about me so yeah. it, that is the the unfortunate thing about it so it's good for helping booksellers categorize books but then you get this unfortunate thing where people just decide that they only read within certain genres or they only read literary fiction which somehow is often considered to be a transcendent of genre and then you get the whole divide between literary and commercial fiction and how genre fiction is often considered to be not as good as literary fiction yeah and so many times i've heard genre being used as a synonym for rubbish yeah no, exactly please like, stop doing that it's yeah. like commercial trash and it's like just because you know things that people want to read and sell a lot as as is very common with say tv shows you know there's a really popular tv show you're like really basic if you like it and it's just it's kind of that it's where as soon as something becomes mainstream or sells a lot it's considered not as good basically so Best way to be hated, apart from getting a seven book deal, yeah. <laughs> um, is to start trashing other people's writing. Oh, yeah. Greg, Gregory Wayne did 
did an interview with this uh, just about a week ago. Mm. Did she? Um, yes, really putting down genre fiction. Oh, um, did she? What? Did she? What? Such what? a huge backlash against her. Is she right to do that? What does she think she's writing? Yeah, yeah it's you know. like surely she writes genre fiction. She yeah. does. Yeah. <laughs> Gregory is like a distinct brand of historical fiction. Yes, she is. Yeah. Oh, come so on. But also, like, what gets me, what really gets up my nose about people who say, oh, yes, you know, there's commercial fiction and that's populist and awful. And then there's literary fiction, you know, like your Dickens. Or Dickens. What? People queued at the docks mm. for Dickens. Mm. The the most the, the only author since then who's created that kind of attention in the general populace has been J.K. Rowling. <laughs> it's the, it was popular at the time. It was called yeah, trash exactly. at the time. Oh no, every, like everything that's classic now is yeah, pretty much called trash at the time. Yeah. So it's it, yeah. It's Shakespeare like, popular rubbish. Oh yeah. No, yeah. He, was, he was considered massive trash at the time. Oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> By <laughs> Ben Johnson. Yeah. <laughs> Stock. <laughs> and now everyone goes, sorry, who's Ben Johnson? Yeah, like, oh, yeah. I do like a bit of Ben. I see, I don't. I can read Shakespeare with little notes, but Johnson it gives me a headache after about six lines. Tiny bit. Tiny bit. Well, a sprinkling of Ben. No, what? Yeah. Oh, Volpone yeah. or something. No, it was, no. Really it was good. It was good. Anyway, well, I love Ben. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we, going back to this thing about readership, you, you would have thought post Harry Potter with, you know, having adults reading children's books and, you know, not even YA, but sort of mm. seeing the benefit of a, a strong story. You'd have thought we'd come on further than that. No. That we don't seem to have done, do we? No, and even like writers, you know, um, a famous example actually is when Kazuo Ishiguro wrote The Buried Giant. There was this whole thing about, well, it's definitely not fantasy. Like, even though it had <laughs> there's every. A, there's a dragon in it. There's a dragon. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, and he's like, oh no, definitely not fantasy. Like, and I was like, he's so got on his high horse. <laughs> I was like, come on, like, work with me here. Like, why are you rejecting us? Like, from the, the, no. you know, I, I don't know. It's just really, really frustrating, especially like when you have all the hallmarks of a fantasy book and you still somehow don't want to admit that the book is fantasy. Like, it's, it's and his, his reasoning was, it's what the people of the time believed. That's yes. my reasoning as well. <laughs> people of the time believed in this stuff, therefore I'm writing it as if it's real. I'm still calling it fantasy because it is. Yeah, it's like, I know, I don't know. It's just really, really bizarre. <laughs> But also, I mean, a lot of it is not to do with the story itself, I think, and it's to do with author brand and stuff like that. So, like yes. Book Thief, for example, Marcus Suzak in Australia, his native Australia, because he already had a YA following. Um, so, Book Thief was marketed as YA, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and everywhere else it was marketed as adult, and it's the same story. And, uh, it, it, it's weird it feels how, so yeah. reductive, doesn't it? it yeah. It's weird how they categorise it between countries a lot of the time mm. as well, because I am actually published as YA in a ton of countries, like pretty much almost all of them apart from English, I think I'm published as YA. But when it came to Bloomsbury, they were very firm, they thought it was an adult book, so it just really depends on... I, you know. I mean, talk about the malleability of genre between countries, I mean, yeah. stuff like Schindler's Ark, mm. published as fiction in one country, and non-fiction in another. Yeah. It's, it's a huge difference. Yeah, and it really depends on markets and all kinds of things. It's, you know, it's very, very weird how, how genre ends up being categorised and what age range is considered appropriate and all that kind mm. of thing. It's frustrating as authors, but I think I can see what, why it happens. Yeah. I feel like it's, it's relatively not to do with me, though. I write yeah. the story and then I someone else right. says, oh, you know, it's, as part of the marketing, we're doing this. I'm like, fine. Yes, no, I, th I think that's right. I think we, you know, we, we have to recognise what it is that we do, mm -hmm. and that's right. Speaking of which, what, what would be your advice for aspiring writers? That's broad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> persist. I think persist. And write all the time. It has to be the thing that you run home to. If you hate doing it, don't do it. It's like any other job. If you don't want to do it, don't make your living doing it. You will go insane and die age 35 and be eaten by Alsatians. That's just... It's just... It's really specific. I'm never getting an Alsatian. <laughs> but, it's, but if you love it, keep doing it. Keep loving it. The more you love it, the more you do it, the better you'll get at it. It's like any other craft. You know, if you love carpentry, you'll start out being rubbish at making tables, but eventually you do it enough, you'll get really good at making tables. The same is true in writing. Um, I have a really hipster piece of advice, which is don't take too much advice. Um, I think that was an excellent piece of advice. Thank you, <laughs> um, What I mean by that is I have sometimes, I, I, this was pretty much, I started giving this piece of like anti-advice when I got a message on Tumblr. And this person was like, so I read on a writing blog that you should only write a story if you think that nobody else could write it better than you. 
And I was like, so you're, what you're suggesting is that I should be so arrogant that I think like no other authors on earth can write this story. Like, it, it was just very weird. Like, and it basically, the, the, the result of this advice was that you would never write anything because you would assume that Neil Gaiman could do it better than you. Um, and they, this person had obviously been like creatively just stunned by this and were just horrified. They, they didn't want to write anything. And, I, and they'd obviously just gone on some kind of writing advice block. And the problem with these blogs is I, I appreciate they're often done in good faith to help people but they give this very prescriptive advice like this is how you get a book deal this is how you write a bestseller like there's a formula to it there's not a formula to it I went to the young adult literature convention the other day and they had a panel of new voices every single one of the nine authors on that panel had a totally different publishing story about how they got there how they wrote their book totally different to the point where I was actually quite shocked because none of them had a conventional story and it just goes to show there is not a, I can understand the desire to try and find a formula for it because that would make it a lot easier if there was just a formula you have to follow to write a bestseller or get an agent or get published but there isn't it's very much unique to the individual and so what I'm saying by this is like fine if you want to read advice but take it at, with a pinch of salt don't take it as law it is just advice and also you'll find that a lot of people have advice to give you when you say you're a writer everyone thinks they're an expert on it like they're like oh yes I'm, I would write a novel if only I had time I could have written a bestseller and it's 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 very frustrating and you, you just have to realize that even you know best-selling authors do not know like a formula for it it's there's a whole raft of things involved like luck and timing and so yeah just if you're going to read advice just take it as advice don't take it as a rule book it's, it's a guidebook I think people sometimes forget that the, the operative word is creative writing. We're creative writers. Yeah, it's not prescriptive. And as soon as you yeah. start boiling everything down, especially on Twitter, a tweet say, thou shalt never ever switch POV, or, or you know, well, you shout don't write. tell. That's such yeah. a nonsense, because you can't show everything in a novel. You have to decide what bits you tell, yeah. and so on and so on. And, and the problem is when debut novelists kind of like, to over internalize some of that stuff and boil it down to ten commandments. And well, something like you have to write a thousand words a day, or you have to write every day. And I'm like, I don't write every day. I do it as a full time job. I don't write every single day. In fact, if I if I wrote every single day, I would have a breakdown because I need to sometimes have a break to get some distance from the manuscript so I can come back to it. But it's, it's amazing how many writers will literally say you have to do this to be a novelist, and it's and like you feel dreadful if you're not doing that. Well, oh, you I'm feel not Writer, yeah, writer you feel like you're not doing it properly, and there is no way to do it properly. So that's that's just yeah, I get very angry about this. <laughs> so it makes it just I, I get scared that people's creativity is being crushed by reading this. So just mm -hmm. please don't take it as law. There's there's no law to this. I fully applaud that. One one of my most popular workshops is a breaking the rules mm -hmm. workshop, and then I go into a, a great deal of discussion at the beginning about whether we should use the word rules at all, mm -hmm. um, or whether we should refer to guidelines. But in fact, things matter. And all of that stuff that people have over internalised comes from something real, but then it's just sort of interpreted too rigidly. I always worry about this though, because well, I have quite young students sometimes, so, you know, undergraduates, and they're like, oh, there are no rules. I'm like, yes, there are. <coughs> Apostrophes, that's a rule. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could, you could argue that some writers have gone off. Kind of yeah, like and, then, and then they always say this, and I go, "Are you James Joyce?" <laughs> no, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, James <laughs> Joyce was exactly who I said. This is only James Joyce. <laughs> <That's no word. laughs> Unless you're James Joyce, please use apostrophe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, no, I know another one. Um, what was that book? Um, a girl is a hard form thing. That one used quite fragmented language. Yes. Sometimes it can work, but anyway, yes. <laughs> there are certain it's rules you should probably but... follow. <laughs> Unless I think you need to know what they are first. I mean, grammar, punctuation, all that stuff. We can bend it to our will. Yes. But you have to know what you're doing first. You yes. Know. It can't be a mistake. You have to do it on purpose. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly that. Yeah. Um, who do you most prefer to read? Uh, um, there's an American writer called Robin Hobb, who I just love. I've read everything she's ever written, ever. She's brilliant. She writes high fantasy, incredibly complicated, like yours. Um, very, very political. There can be whole novels of 800 pages where almost nothing happens, but it's utterly absorbing. 
is absolutely incredible, and you care fiercely about nothing happening. And it's, it's, it's so I'm, so, good. I'm so glad these books exist because I've spent way too much time in Priory talking about stuff like what people are wearing. Perfect. <laughs> she spends pages, and it and it's all the things that you think you shouldn't be doing in fantasy, and it just works incredibly well. She's so accomplished. And if anyone hasn't read it. The first book in the series is called The Assassin's Apprentice, and it's fantastic. Oh, I'm going to read this now. I, 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 I'm really going for like pointless details. Like, if you describe like a table to me in like really fine detail, I'm like, yeah, that table, marry me. Yeah. I, I, I literally have to stop myself doing it in my book sometimes. I'm like, it's a very upholstered chair, and quite, nobody cares about the upholstered <laughs> chair, but I care so badly. You love it. You absolutely. Okay, now I'm definitely going to read this. Um, who do I read? I, I, I read a very wide range of things. Like I've, um, I've started doing the Goodreads challenge every year to track what I'm reading. I read, like, really, I just go everywhere. Like, I, I just read a contemporary feminist YA novel, um, but then I'll, I can read very adult sort of stuff another week. I just sort of pick up whatever is nearest to me, usually. I mean, I get, as an author, you get sent quite a lot of books, which is really nice, actually, because you often get sent books that you wouldn't necessarily have picked up yourself. Um, so you get tons of different things. I mean, broadly, I'm a fantasy reader. Um, I love The Watchmaker of uh, Filigree Street. I was Thank so into that. Um, but it's also quite difficult when you're writing fantasy. I don't like reading it while I'm writing it, and mm. I'm often writing it. So it, I, I go, go for large periods of the year where I sort of can't read my preferred genre. So at that point, I'll go into stuff like contemporary. And, yeah, yeah it's if difficult. I'm writing, I can only read non-fiction or something written more than 100 years ago. Yeah. Because otherwise, it's just too much pressure. You go, nope, they've done it better than me. I can't do this. No, exactly. You'll find a sentence that's sort of a little bit similar to a sentence you've written. I mean, once I got really obsessed because two words in the sentence were the same as in mine. They're pretty normal <laughs> words. And I was like, oh my god, they use the same two words as me. There's well, no such thing as I mean, originality. I'm going to have to cross out that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, it really, like, I, it doesn't really help that I have anxiety, so I like properly obsess over stuff like that. Like, I'm convinced that everyone, if there's like a word that's the same, I'm like a plagiarist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, I often just can't read fantasy while I'm writing it. So just for my mental sanity. But yeah, I have a pretty pretty broad range. But generally, I do like sort of speculative. My favourite book is The Handmaid's Tale. Um, oh yes. Yes, uh, Margaret Atwood is the queen. Um, but yeah, so. I think if there was one piece of advice, read. read oh yes, read, read, read is read, another read, one. Read. Yeah. Um, within your genre, outside your genre, stories all have stuff in common. Um, the, I have so many people that come to me and they don't read, and they think that they can write a book. And you think, how? Why? You know. I think most of us write the kind of books that we want to read anyway. Yeah, definitely. So. Uh, Anyway, it's time for me to hand over to you. So, Lord, I can't have covered everything. I'm sure you must have lots of things to ask. Yes. Um, yeah. I'm just going to take fine. this off. Can you hear me from here? If you just Maybe yell, so that we go back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I just want to know, you just talked about originality, but there's thousands of books published every year and mm -hmm. about a thousand times more authors who wish to be published. So how can we still be original as aspiring authors? I feel like whatever story you tell, it will have been told in some shape or form a hundred thousand times. And there will be comparisons that you can make to many, many other things. You're never going to write an utterly original story that is completely divorced from the rest of literature, because if you do, you end up with Finnegan's Wake, and no one will ever read it. <laughs> you feel pretty, pretty boffity if you know the title of something like that. And it's just, I think any book is always a reply to a previous book, or many previous books, or all the previous books you've ever read, and it becomes this conglomeration of stuff. But what's new is the time that you live in. That's never happened before. There will be times that are similar, there will be people who are similar, but you yourself have never existed before. This moment hasn't happened before, which means that somewhere there will be some variation, some difference in perspective, in content, something. So you can, you can tell the same basic story. I mean, we've been doing this for you know, the last 150 years. When you look at something like Fifty Shades of Grey, the structure is Jane Eyre. It just is. It's, you know, 
fairly poor, fi you know, fi in financial difficulty woman meets a mentally rich man who is hugely bad tempered. That is the basic structure. <laughs> <laughs> this is, and this is the Byronic hero who has yeah. existed for, for uh, uh, more than 200 years now. But we still love that story. We love it for a reason. It's not stereotype, it's archetype. And it's, that's important, I think. We all, anyone who writes, owes a debt to what's come before. And you can only continue by replying to it. So I don't think when we say originality, we don't mean something utterly new, pressure. It means a new perspective, a new twist. These differences are small, and they're easily taken. And a new voice. Your voice will be different from everybody that's, else's voice. That's what I was about to say. O only you can write a story like you can. Like this, it, it doesn't. Even if you were to write the story of Jane Eyre, it would still be different from Bronte's version of Jane Eyre. Um, it, you, anything. You are always going to write a story that brings your personal experiences, your personal style. So whatever story you write, only you can tell it like that. So that's just the very basic piece of advice I give. Just even if you're thinking, God, this is like exactly the same story as something else. Obviously, don't try to do that. Try to bring originality to it. But even if you're writing a very well-worn type story, only you can write that like that because you're bringing your life to it. And there is only one you. So. Thank you. Yeah. I was just going to say, how do you, how do each of you, um, how would each of you describe courage in relation to your work? How do courage. you? Yes. How are you courageous in your writing? I'm not bloody coward. Let's have go straight in there. Oh, what yeah. is courage? Yeah. <laughs> what is this courage business? I'm such a coward in real life and in fiction. I am risk averse. It's just yeah. uh, there's nothing brave about it. I would so I'd say it's just. It's not there. It's absent. <laughs> I, I think the problem with courage is that if either of us were to say we were courageous, we would sound massively arrogant. So I'm going to maybe come at it from not using that word, which I suppose is just not... I, I suppose a form of courage in fiction is trying not to mind too much if people don't like your work. Um, and that's something you have to accept as a writer because it doesn't matter what you write. And there's, there's this very annoying term that gets thrown around in publishing, which is... This book received mixed reviews. <laughs> Every book receives mixed reviews. <laughs> Go on to Harry Potter on Goodreads and switch to one star and you will find many, many, many people who didn't like Harry Potter. And it's, it's just, just this weird thing. Um, so you have to accept, when you are a writer, you, you cannot go in there thinking that everyone is going to like your work. You have to accept criticism. You have to accept the fact that you can't also enter the space of the critic too much. You have to allow people to read books and respond to them how they like. A typical example of what not to do is when I was a young, fresh-faced, 20-year-old writer, I saw someone who read an excerpt of The Bone Season on Twitter, and they were basically saying, God, she's just the worst writer. I can't believe Bloomsbury are publishing her. She's terrible. And I decided to passive-aggressively go in there and be like, Thank you so much for your advice <laughs> on Twitter. Completely unsolicited. No one had included me in the conversation. So it was really, really obvious that I'd vanity searched my <laughs> got me in big trouble because people were like, oh my god, look at this author, she's coming into critic spaces, oh my god, blacklist her immediately, author's behaving badly. It was terrible, I apologised immediately in terror. But um, <laughs> that's what you don't do. You don't go into the critic space. And unfortunately you have to learn this as an author because no one tells you this, but you have to appreciate that people are going to read and respond to your work. And I guess that is a form of courage. You have to just accept that people are going to be saying some terrible, terrible things about you and you have to just carry on. You have to have thick skin and appreciate that not everyone's going to like your work. So I think in that way, everyone who puts pen to paper and shares it is enormously courageous. And I say, I say this to people, you know, even if they're, you know, they're saying, oh, I'm not published, I'm not very good. I'm saying, look, even whatever you've written, if you're sharing it with someone, if you're trying to commit your thoughts into words, which is, you know, really, it's a big thing, trying to put thoughts into little glyphs on a page and make them make sense. I do think that's a form of courage. You're sharing really private, intimate thoughts with the world. So I think all writers are courageous. Uh, yeah. Hi. So basically, um, I'm doing a, like, a, a collection of novels in like, dark fantasy. So it's a mixture of, like, of, um, of fantasy and horror, mm -hmm. extreme violence. So kind of inspired by Game of Thrones, a little bit of J.K. Rowling, a little bit of Neil Gaiman, and then my kind of like, big big fans. Um, 
I'd love to be around actually, I'm a big fan of them, not me. <laughs> <laughs> they are actually very big fans of me. <laughs> I wish, I wish that was the case. But, um, so I had this last debate with my sister a week ago, we were talking about my story. So the, main, the first like, story I wanted to do, it would be the main character was a serial killer. You said that with too much of a happy expression. <laughs> not a happy expression, but more like, um, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the discussion that she had with me. And she was worried for me because she said, I'm going to support any way and shape from how you what you write. However, I'm worried that the, uh, the, uh, the public would not appreciate you painting a Syrica in a particular light. And I felt like, and I put it back to her, well, Adam Hitchcock said, what interesting villains are what make great stories. Yeah. So I want to ask you to cut you too about villains in particular when it comes to dark fantasy or any particular fantasy. How essential are they to make a really, really, really fun story to read? Who even is the villain in Watchmaker? Is there one? There's no like, villain. No, yeah, I don't really, really write there. villains. And the reason is that I feel like if someone is just outright evil in a novel, you're writing something two-dimensional. So if there, and th this is really a kind of adult fiction thing because I think often in in children's fiction, a villain plays a different role. It's it's often to establish that a good person can conquer adversity, and the adversity is uh, symbolised by a particular villain character. In adult fiction, we already know this. Mm -hmm. We don't need to know that there are dragons and they can be slain. We know this from children's stories. So adult fiction, I think, does something else. And so if you're writing someone who is just a bastard, unashamedly, for no reason, um, it's worth looking at that again because they'll, they'll be a bastard for a reason. And if you've got reasons and a backstory and you can make a reader understand why they like that, why the decision process is happening, then you'll have an amazing, interesting person. And they won't just be a cartoon villain. There will be Hannibal Lecter. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah no, I, I agree. And I, I, weirdly, I actually just took part in a, a short story anthology, which was all about villains and telling villain stories, which was a really kind of fun experiment. Um, but I think primarily you have to remember that every character is the protagonist of their own story, including the villain. Um, weirdly, when I was writing Priory, the kind of overarching villain in that is basically just an embodiment of evil, and that was quite weird for me writing that because it's not something I'm very used to. But I, it was more that's more of a symbolic, almost kind of like a kids type villain, where the, the villain represents something to be overcome. But in the Bone Season series, all of my villains are complex and all of them are very much painted in shades of grey. I understand what they are trying to do in their mind. It just so happens that that is coming into conflict with what my hero is trying to do. And I, I really think that that is the best way to write villains. I, I definitely wouldn't shy away from writing what you're doing. I mean, in fact, I'm kind of planning a sequel to The Priory of the Orange Tree, which I haven't sold or anything yet, but one of the characters would be one of the villains from Priory, and she is messed up, but I cannot wait to do it. Because <laughs> it's another thing about writing is you can explore those dark aspects of human nature without actually doing it yourself, which is probably why writers have so many dodgy Google search histories, such as, <laughs> how do I hide a body? <laughs> um, Mine was, how do you make a bomb? I'm surprised no, oh, that MI6 yeah, didn't no. knock on my door. No, I've, <laughs> yeah. I, I've, I've had some really weird ones. I've had to Google search and like you honestly think the police are going to be after you in a minute. But it is, it is incredibly liberating to be able to explore these dark aspects of human nature. And there's, this is kind of similar in, in young adult fiction where a book is kind of a safe space in which to explore certain things. Um, so you can explore, for example, I don't know, being addicted to drugs or being an alcoholic, but, you, but people can do that within the safe space of the book. So I, I think that villains, like, I, I would encourage you to write all sorts of people, but just try not to think of them as being the villain in their own story. Like, even, even if it's a serial killer, they usually have some kind of rationale, not necessarily one that you want the reader to be, like, really behind. <laughs> but they have to have at least one in their own mind. But the, the bone season, 
in, in the song rising there's a scene between my character and the main villain of the whole series during which the villain basically explains her rationale weirdly when I was writing it I was starting to say yeah yeah I can really see this but I had to keep it to the point where I was still on the hero side but I could understand her perspective and I think it's important to do that to create a good villain because otherwise they are almost like a cartoon character you know just kind of Doctor Evil type figure laughing in the corner it's the eye on the tower though. yeah exactly yeah, it's, it's like, and again that does serve a function and I was weirdly surprised when I ended up doing that in Priory um, but I enjoyed uh, that's a very different kind of story whereas, is that, and at that point the villain is a symbol and, yes. and a metaphor rather yeah. than a person it's, they're um, not really a character in that whole story yes you know, so you know, they're more complex, like,